Now it's noon in Japan. Good afternoon and good evening, fellow Toastmasters and friends of Toastmasters. Welcome to the special online session of Hiroshima Phoenix Toastmasters Club. My name is Emiko Morikawa, president of Hiroshima Phoenix Toastmasters Club. I take the honor of officially calling our special meeting to order. First of all, our PR committee chair, as well as today's Zoom host, Toastmaster Masayo Arai, will make a very important announcement. Masayo-san, please go ahead. Yes, I'm Masayo Arai, the vice president of PR of this club, Hiroshima Phoenix Toastmasters Club. As a representative of the recording and the photo taking team, let me make a very important notice. This meeting is already being recorded. Some of, some of the recording portion or hall or the, some of the pictures of the screenshot will be publicized. So if anyone who is not comfortable by showing your face on the public site as our in that will be in our Facebook probably. Please turn off your camera. Thank you for your cooperation and please enjoy this event. Back to you, Emiko san. Thank you, Masayo san, Vice President Public Relations. Secondary, we will uh, I'd like to ask Toastmaster Jean to read Toastmaster's club mission, which is a tradition of our club in order to unite our minds. Jean, are you ready? You bet. Thank you, Madam Chair. We provide a supportive and positive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. Thank you, Jean, for your dignified reading. Today, I'm so grateful that we have so many guests from all over the world. And let me call your attention, former special session presenters, Mr. Dairiki and his wife is, uh, are here. And how about Peter? Not yet, not yet, okay, later. I think, uh, thank you very much for being with us. We usually recognize all guests individually at the beginning of the meeting, but apparently it is not possible today with so many guests in attendance. Thank you so much. Please excuse us for skipping to introduce the honorable guests for now. Today, we are so honored and thrilled to welcome Ms. Leslie Susan from the United States. Before inviting her to the stage, let me briefly introduce her. Let me share the screen. Okay, please take a look at young mothers with their lively kids. Desri and I are here. It was back in 1988. Once upon a time, we 23 people enjoyed a farewell picnic, picnic party before Desri and her daughter Kendra left for America. Desri was a close friend of mine, so called Mama Tomo or a mom friend at that time. Desri Susan was born in New York City. Oh. And currently lives outside Washington DC with her daughter Kendra. Desri retired in 2022 from a long career as an attorney and then 
an administrative judge for the federal government. Leslie's father served with the army in World War II and was sent with a film crew to record the only color footage of the Avon cities. After his death, Desri and Kendra spent a year in Hiroshima, coming to know Hibakusha, including some who remembered her father from that time. Mm -hmm. Desri has long been a pacifist and is a member of a Quaker meeting in Maryland. In 2020, she published a book entitled Choosing Life, My Father's Journey in Film from Hollywood to uh, Hiroshima. The book was written based on what she learned in Hiroshima and what she discovered in an oral history her father left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming today's guest speaker, Jessri Susan, to the screen with clapping hands. Good evening, Desri. Hi, thank you for that lovely introduction and for that picture, which I haven't seen before. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I would say konbanwa. Konnichiwa. Asoko de. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so okay, th thank you for giving us such a blessing opportunity to think and talk about peace across borders. So, now, Desri, are you ready to take over the screen now? Yes, let me uh, see if I can manage the magic of technology here. Yes. Uh, there we go. And from the beginning. So um, I want to thank Hiroshima Toastmasters Phoenix Club, and especially, of course, its president, Morikawa-san. I want to thank everyone who has worked so hard to organize today's event, and to all of you who made the time to join us this evening. Here it's 11 o'clock at night or this afternoon where, for those of you in Japan. I am asked sometimes, who am I to tell stories about the atomic bomb? Or about Hiroshima? And I think it's a good question. I'm not an expert on nuclear weapons. I am not a historian. I was not alive during World War II and I did not experience the bomb. My answer to this question is based on an old story about five blind men trying to understand what an elephant is. Each one is touching a different part of the elephant. The one touching the leg says, an elephant is like a tree trunk. The one touching the side says, an elephant is like a wall. The one touching the tail says an elephant is like a rope. The one touching the ear says an elephant is like a fan. The one touching the trunk says an elephant is like a fire hose. And no one is lying when they tell their piece of the truth, but none of them know what a whole elephant is. I have touched and been touched by the consequences of the atomic bombings in Japan. And I have a truth to share about nuclear weapons. I have touched a small part of a great and terrible reality. I don't claim to know the whole elephant, but I feel a duty to share the truth about what I have seen and heard with a world that still lies under the threat of nuclear war. Only when we all share and hear each other's truths and perspectives can we begin to understand the whole picture 
of what these weapons mean for the future of human life. And only with that understanding do we have the best chance to prevent another city from facing Hiroshima's fate and to build a peaceful world free from that looming terror. So that's who I am to share as faithfully as I can what my piece of the elephant is like. When my father was dying in 1986, he told my brother that he wanted his ashes scattered on the ground zero at Hiroshima. We did not know what to do about this strange last wish. Eventually, I learned that the Japanese government would not allow the scattering of human ashes. I thought deeply about why my father had such a desire. To understand that required learning about the central event of his life, about which he almost never spoke to his family, his experiences during the war. As a boy, my father loved movies above all other things. He believed in the power of living color to make a world more real than ordinary life. He studied cinematography, how to make movies, at the University of Southern California so he could make this magic too. When he was 20, though, the war began, or at least it began for the United States, and he left college and became an officer in the U.S. Army Air Corps. His first assignment was back to Hollywood. His commanding officer was Ronald Reagan, who would later become president of the United States. But then he was an actor who was in charge of using the studios to make movies for the military to use. Later, my father shipped out to the Pacific Theater of War. By August of 1945, he was stationed at Iyeshima, which was under attack by kamikaze fighters. It was there that he heard the announcement of Japan's surrender and saw the surrender delegation. And he was happy, happy that the war was over, happy that the allies had won, especially because he was Jewish and his parents were refugees to America who had fled the persecution of Jews in Europe. Six million Jews had been murdered by the Germans and now such horrors would end, life would return to normal. So of course he joined in the celebrations at the end of the war. Then he was sent to join the occupying forces in Japan. He was excited and curious to see this exotic to him country, this enemy that his country had conquered. Because of his movie making skills, training that was rare in those days before video cameras and smartphones, he was assigned to a special mission of the Strategic Bombing Survey. They had orders directly from the president to make a record of the effectiveness of strategic bombing in Japan, and in particular of the atomic bombings. His crew took possession of an imperial train and took all the color movie film in the area and set out. When they pulled into the devastation that had once been Nagasaki, my father was stunned. He had seen bombed cities, but never such a complete destruction as they encountered in the Valley of Nagasaki. The train 
arrived first at the station or at a platform that had once been the station. The station master and his employees bowed deeply. Harry Mamora, a Japanese American filmmaker who worked with the crew, served with the crew, spoke to the station master and came back and explained that the station master apologizes because he no longer has a station to welcome them. Something about this formal greeting struck my father as especially poignant and moving. Most of the crew in Nagasaki focused on filming around ground zero in widening circles to make a record of the effect of the bomb at various distances. My father and Harry Mamura, who have, however, um, I should say in the picture with the Jeep, um, that's the crew as a whole. And my father is um, sitting, he's the second from the left in the front row of the Jeep. Um, and in the other picture, uh, the one with the camera is Harry Mamura, and my father is standing beside him as they as they film a scene. Um, Harry Mamura and my father decided to concentrate on the human impact of the bomb. They had known nothing about radiation, and they could not understand why the hospitals were crowded with so many severely ill patients. In other bomb cities they had traveled through, by this time, four to five months after the end of the war, most casualties had either died or recovered, even if they had scars and lasting injuries. The hospitals in the other cities were emptying out. In Nagasaki, the doctors were still overwhelmed by patients getting sicker and injuries that would not heal. My father realized as they did the filming that the people he saw suffering in the Nagasaki and later Hiroshima hospitals were not the terrifying enemy that he had been told about. They were ordinary women, children, and old people. His heart began to ache. He got permission to stay longer in the Adams Bomb cities and to make a record of what had happened to it, their inhabitants. One patient whose situation moved him most in Nagasaki was a teenaged boy whose back was entirely burned away who was being bathed in penicillin. The doctors told him that the boy was unlikely to survive. And my father felt badly for decades, feeling that the lights, the bright lights that they used for filming might have added to the dying boy's pain. He was amazed to learn many years later that Sumitero Taniguchi-san survived and had children and grandchildren. And when they met again in Nagasaki in 1984, Tanaguchi-san told him that actually the warmth of the lights had been comforting. When they arrived in Hiroshima later, they again focused on human suffering and the hospitals, although they were equally stunned by the devastation. And in fact, its extent was much greater than in Nagasaki because of the flatness of the land around Hiroshima that allowed the blast to travel a greater distance. In the Hiroshima hospitals, he was particularly moved by a lovely young woman brought to the roof of the hospital for filming in her damaged kimono. She had lost her leg he assumed that she too was likely to have died 
as so many did when their wounds would not heal. But she lived, in fact, a long life and spent many years working for peace and doing kataribe in Peace Park. During her kataribe, she would show a picture of my father and tell about the filming. And in the picture from my time in Hiroshima, she's showing the photograph that she used. When the crew finished filming, my father dreamed that these, foot, these films, this footage would teach the world about this terrible new weapon. Surely, he felt, if Americans understood its reality, they would never want to use it again. But instead, the government classified the footage as top secret. And despite trying repeatedly for decades, he was never even permitted to see the footage, much less make the film, the movie that he dreamed of from it. And this is the actual order of secrecy, uh, which we were finally able to get a copy of. The films were classified secret long enough for the military to make training films and then elevated to top secret. He returned to Manhattan, to New York City, but over and over again for the first year, he was gripped by terrifying visions of what his home city would look like after an atomic bomb. He became a director and producer of television programs, but he continued to seek access to the films from everyone he could, including speaking to past president Harry Truman, the answer was always no. By 1979, my father was suffering from cancer, which he believed resulted from his time in the atom bomb cities. Despite his poor health, when he learned about a UN event on disarmament with an exhibition of photographs from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he had to go. There, he saw a photograph of the same boy with the burned back and approached the exhibitor to tell him that he had filmed the same boy. Thus, Sumitomo Iwakura-san learned from my father about the suppressed film, and he returned to Japan to launch the 10-foot campaign, which obtained the footage, release of the footage and later traced many of the hibakusha who appeared in it. They made several short movies using bits of the raw footage from my father's crew, along with interviews of some of the survivors. Some of those short films, movies were shown later at the United Nations and my, mother's, my father's mother, my grandmother saw them there. She said that for the first time, she understood why the son that returned to her from Japan was not the boy who had gone to war. Something was broken in him that never fully healed. Only recently I learned that my father was still seeking at that time to get Congress to acknowledge how the government had suppressed the footage. His congressman put into the congressional record a statement that enabling a wide audience to view his film has been an enduring goal of Susan's life. And then he quoted my father saying, I wanted to get the footage so that the American people could see firsthand what the real effects of the bombs were. And if they saw the effects, I felt there would be a groundswell against ever using nuclear weapons of any type again. In 1984, my father, the 10 foot campaign brought my father back to Japan to see a very changed Hiroshima. He was able to reunite with survivors, including Suzuku, Suzuku Numata-san, the young woman in the kimono. Just over a year after his visit, 
he passed away, leaving behind that last wish. I came to Hiroshima in 1987 with my daughter, Kendra, who's not four years old anymore, but you can see her um, as a four-year-old in 1987, and then a little bit older during one of our return visits, um, where we were able to spend some time with Numata Sensei. I came um, to Hiroshima and was welcomed by many wonderful people, among them, as she said, Morikawa-san, who helped me um, adjust to living there and find a kindergarten for my daughter and a place to live. I held a small memorial service for my father in front of the mound, and I made a vow then that since I would not be able to spread his ashes, I would instead spread his story. We lived in Hiroshima for a year with much help from friends, and I was able to speak to Hibaksha, some of whom remembered my father filming them, especially Numata Sensei. They graciously shared their painful stories, and I came to understand that having the films taken at the time was so distressing for them. But they said they were now glad that the record existed. And I promised to honor and share their stories too. We became part of Hiroshima in its daily life and joined in protests for peace there. So I had made many promises to my late father, to the Hibakusha, and to myself. And I felt a sense of duty, especially to my daughter and to all the children of the world, to expose truths about nuclear weapons that the government had tried to hide from us all for so long. I felt that the bombs dropped on Japan caused ripples of pain that spread across continents and through generations and impacted four generations of my family, even though not one of us was present at Picadon. It took me almost 30 years to keep my promises by writing this book. And I felt bad for a long time that I didn't complete the book sooner. But now I think the time was necessary. By the time I published the book, I was older than my father ever lived to be. And I could understand my father in a more mature way and also comprehend how very young he was in 1945 and how traumatized he was by his experiences. I could then understand better why he was so frustrated for many years at failing to make the movie he dreamed of, and also why he was unable to talk to us about his experience. I came to feel that we have a duty to our parents to preserve these, their stories and to learn from them. And that we have a duty too to our children to make a better and more peaceful world for them. I hope that my book is better for the greater wisdom of more years, even though it arrives much later than I wished. My book itself is not an argument about World War II or even about the US decision to use the atomic bomb. My book is not about the past at all. It's a plea for the future, and its argument is simple. We know better now. We should do better. Those in power today are not learning the lessons of the past and risk repeating the horrors at an even greater scale as weapons become modernized. There is another version of the elephant story in which five blind elephants try to understand what a man is. 
the first elephant touches a man with his foot and says, men are flat. All the other elephants touch the man and agree, men are flat. Nuclear weapons are like those blind elephants. If they touch humankind again, it will be flattened. I called my book Choosing Life because we have a choice. In the Jewish Bible, God says to the people, I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. And he calls on them to therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Nuclear weapons are a curse and we must choose life for ourselves and for our descendants. Thank you very much. That is what I wanted to share. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much, Desri. Your presentation deepened our understanding and enlight enlightened us about the importance of peaceful world, hope free without nuclear weapons. Before moving on to the breakout room session, Let's take a picture together. PR committee member, please go ahead. Welcome back. Now the forum is all yours. I hope you talked a lot about uh, relating to anything about peace. So from now on, uh, please feel free to say your comment to Leslie or to uh, ask questions to Leslie. Please, uh, please wave your hand or show, raise your hand sign like this if possible, to indicate that you have a question or a comment to Desri. Okay. Okay, Gary, you are raising your hand. Please how do we get a copy? How do we get a copy of this book? Desri. Well, thank <laughs> you for asking that question. Um, <laughs> it's available from um, Pretty much anywhere that carries books, uh, Amazon, bookshop.org, Barnes and Noble. Um, as of now, it's only available in English, but I am in the process of trying to arrange for a Japanese translation. I have one more question. Hi, I'm Deborah. And I wanted to know, uh, how do I get a contact with you to come and speak? In our American group, our American group, uh, Ward Reavers, which uh, they, our group is a storytelling group, and we would love to have you. Oh, that sounds lovely. Yeah, I actually, I'll put my um, email in the chat, and I'm happy to hear from anybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, next uh, person to, to, to ask is, uh, Ota, KY, KY, please. Ah, thank you. Ah, thank you very much. Ah, thank you, Susan San, for a wonderful speech. I was very amazed by your speech, especially your father. And uh, in breakout room, we talked about uh, your speech, and uh, I would like to share two things. First, the one member in the room said uh, the important thing is our life. The uh, Hibakusha, uh, Sunao Tsuboi san, uh, said, uh, Children, important thing is our life. Please uh, pay attention to our life. 
、uh, that's what the children were amazed. So I think it's good to think to make a peaceful world. Secondly,、uh, one member said,、oh, we have no solution to exact solution to heal the world. Therefore, we want to seek how we change the mind and another、uh, change the mind to seek solution.、Uh, that's what we talked about.、Uh, I would like to share that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right. You,、uh, I'm very happy to know that your group、uh, did a Very helpful and nice discussion. Okay, next person, Veronica. How about Veronica? Please. Ah, you are muted. Thank you very much, Madam President. And thank you so much, Leslie, for that.、Uh, I don't know, it was so moving. I don't have words to, to describe what、uh, you have told us today. But I do have a question. I would like to know what have you done with your father's ashes? Actually, this will probably not、uh, feel very good for Japanese people, but I think it was right for my father. My brother and I hired an airplane with, from which his ashes were spread across the Manhattan Bay.、Um, so, He was, he had a sense, which I didn't understand until I lived there, that Hiroshima was very much like Manhattan.、Um, I think the reason is because, you know, Manhattan is an island with river running on both sides. It, it, Hiroshima is maybe a delta, but it feels like an island with. Also, so many bridges and the water all around it. And Manhattan is a very commercial place with lots of, of business buildings. And Hiroshima was, you know, kind of more like that compared to Nagasaki. Somehow he always, you know, as I said, he, he always felt, especially the first year he was back, but even after, he felt that、um, he could imagine. Or he was forced to imagine, you could see、um, the aftermath of an atomic bomb in Manhattan.、Um, shadows on the brownstone stairs, like on the bank steps,、um, twisted bridges would flash to him.、Um, so my brother and I felt that、uh, if it could not be in Hiroshima, he would be more at peace by. Uh, sharing his ashes with the, the city that he was so afraid for. I will tell you too that、um, I'm sure you've heard about 9 11, and my brother was in the building right across the street when the World Trade Center came down. He was actually on the last subway train. Underneath the World Trade Center was a subway station, and he was on the last train that morning. Before the buildings came down. So he had just crossed the street when it happened. And he had to walk the whole length of Manhattan to get home. And of course, my, his sons, his boys were young then. I just came from one of his sons' weddings, but he was young then. And we were talking on the computer the whole time because we couldn't find him. The, all the phone towers were down. And when he got there, he got on the computer to speak to me. And the first thing he said to me is that it, it was like such a Holocaust with the、um, dust and the flames. And he said he had seen our father's vision of Manhattan come true. So I still feel because of that happening in Manhattan, now we have a ground zero. So, Anyway, I know it's not a Japanese custom, but I feel that was the right thing to do for my father's ashes. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you,、uh, Veronica, and thank you, Leslie, for answering her question. Uh, that, uh, we, we know now 
lots of facts. Okay, the next person to ask is Hiromi san. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. See, uh, it's not a question. I want to tell, tell her my impression. Yeah, of course. Very, yeah, of course. I was very impressed with Leslie's words. Her father's last wish is to scatter his ashes over the uh, Grand Zero, but she said she couldn't do it, but she spread his story to all over the world, that means Leslie um, fulfilled her mission to tell the peace instead of um, her father. Great job. And she, Leslie said, she wrote her book not only to tell the past, but also to uh, tell. Uh, the future generation, how to build a peaceful world. Thank you, Leslie. I, I haven't read your story yet, but I'm going to buy it and read it, sure. Thank you, I feel like crying. I'm so <laughs> glad to, to feel that uh, I fulfilled the wish correctly because it was very difficult to know what to do. Yeah, thank you, Hiromi-san. What you said is just, <laughs> just right. Okay, thank you. Okay, next uh, questioner is uh, Masayo-san, please. Uh, okay. Thank you for appointing me, Miko-san. Uh, we have a very, very deep and so impressive discussion after your very thoughtful. Uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Leslie. First, uh, I would like to state our question, and we had lots of comments, so maybe later. The question is that uh, what happened to the photos and uh, films after your father and your team or other clerk, uh, clerks took uh, 70 something years ago? After What happened after that? What happened to the films? Mm -hmm. Right. So actually, um, when my father and his crew returned to Tokyo, he was um, he was traumatized and he was depressed. And a military doctor sent him for what they call R and R, rest and recreation, um, out to Nikko, and uh, he arrived at Nikko. And he thought, this is a peaceful and a healing place. Maybe I'll be better. But the next morning, there was a uh, army uh, policeman on his door and told him he was ordered to return to Tokyo immediately. And when he got to Tokyo, the office where they had worked and the footlocker um, with half the foot films was gone. One footlocker remained, and there was an order on it for him to take it to Washington uh, by the fastest possible means. So he left that day on a long airplane trip. Of course, airplanes were not so fast then, so they had to make stops um, and brought it to Washington. And he was met by military police who seized the footlocker. That's the last time my father ever saw the actual films. But he kept, um, as I said, he he wrote to people. He had a friend with top secret clearance who tried to find them. And it turned out that the, for many years, they were held at an Air Force base in California, um, guarded by the man who had been his commanding officer, Daniel McGovern. Um, he later admitted that... Uh, you know, they wouldn't release the films, but that he thought he had done a good job because he kept them from being destroyed. And it was not only their films. They, the Army also seized black and white footage that was shot earlier by Japanese filmmakers. Um, and that was also stored there. When the 10-foot campaign began demanding the films, um, because it was long past the time 
that the law required them to be declassified. Uh, then the, the government said, oh, the films are in the National Archives, but there was no record of them, so no one could find them. But that's where they told um, Iwakura-san the films were, and he was able to get a print of the films with the money that was raised by the 10-foot campaign. I should say there's actually a, a movie that was finally made a short documentary um, for Americans. Uh, it's called Atomic Cover-Up, and the producer is Greg Mitchell, who wrote the foreword to my book. He had interviewed my father many times in the 70s and 80s and wrote about him. Um, and he produced a film that uh, includes both color footage and some of the black and white footage and the words of both sets of filmmakers about how it affected them. Unfortunately, it's not available free um, as I think it should be, but I will put into the chat a link where you can um, see uh, a, a part of it and where schools and, and institutions can um, borrow and buy a print. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may, may I continue uh, reporting the comments or peacemaking uh, idea? May I? Okay. Uh, uh, my room where I belong was so impressive uh, group. And uh, education is the most important to keep the peaceful world or avoid war, to let everyone know about the, what happened after the Hiroshima or what was uh, the situation in Hiroshima. The many dozens of American uh, people lived in Hiroshima when the when atomic bomb fell. And uh, the, one of the, my, my, my room participants uh, reported that the, he is a tour guide and to show the those uh, memorial uh, places to explain to the uh, people in the overseas. And they, they said that this is the first time to see that it's a real fact what happened at that time. And uh, one quote from the participants in my break, breakout room is to, um, allow the what happened as a victims of the war is the important you know uh, who is bad who is good who is victim who, who made her, made them hurt it's not a problem but to allow them and uh, accept the situation not to make a uh, continuous fight over activity, but to accept the situation is the start point to keep the war after the war, or keep the peace after the war. That's our club of our room okay. comments. Thank you, Masayo-san, for your precise report of your breakout room. Uh, we are very happy to know very helpful and nice discussions were held. Okay, next uh, questioner. Uh, Toastmaster Bunzo Suzuki, please. Okay, thank you very much. In our room, room number five, we talked about the uh, vice of the war, warfare itself, uh, be it nuclear or non-nuclear. but. Uh, there is clearly a difference between the non-nuclear non and nuclear result. And we talked about it as uh, we learned from your story of the hospital being uh, very crowded even after four or five years in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not like that in other places. And there was one question, but uh, instead of asking that question, I take the liberty as the facilitator of changing the subject and asking Mr. Daireki 
to give us your impressions about the story by Leslie Sun. Mr. Dairiki is the first presenter of this special session two years ago. Can you, can you unmute your microphone? Someone can you, someone can help? Well, I mean, oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh. It's um, muted again. Okay, I'm now. I'm a survivor of the atomic bomb, age 92 at this point. Mm -hmm. I have an aunt, Shizuko Abe, who was interviewed by many, many uh, reporters, and she lived uh, near Hiroshima. And she's 97, still alive, half of her body were burned. She was uh, about a mile away from the atomic bomb. She was on a rooftop working at, uh, taking a tile off the roof. And she saw the three aircraft in the air and that's when it exploded. So you could see she was exposed up in the, uh, on the roof. So 50% of her body was uh, uh, involved. And uh, today she's still, amazingly still alive. Many plastic surgery was done. And uh, she traveled from the United States uh, to England, Germany, and Russia to show her injury to the nation that this is what happened to the atomic bomb victim. So never to use it again. And amazingly, she's still alive and very active and uh, try to, to show the, uh, the world what have happened to the victim of the atomic bomb. Thank you for this moment. Yes. And I see every new year uh, from NHK, put her on the, uh, the television show and show her that injury and, and listen to her story. She was 19 at the time and uh, how she survived. But uh, basically uh, she talked about how people have uh, teased her look like a obake, red, red, red devil. Because after the burn, the, the burn area turned red. And as she walked down the street, the children to call out and said, Red Devil, Red Devil. And I, I find it very unkind for the children to say that. But understand her children, three children also uh, are teased by the society. And that's very not, not very, uh, very sad to hear that. So uh, thank you for that inquiry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tadike-san. I did uh, listen to the recording of your presentation, and it was very moving, telling about your experiences. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Kusuma uh, Suzuki, do you have any more thing to add? Okay, one of the questions specifically raised during our session was that, uh, what can we do to this differentiate uh, our effort to impress upon the listeners, audience, what's uh, how different nuclear uh, effects are from the effects from the non-nuclear warfare. Of course, uh, both types of the effects from the warfare are uh, uh, devastating, but uh, we still need to differentiate the difference. How effectively can we communicate that message? So in my, my view anyway, I'm sure many here know and can answer much better than me uh, about that. But there are two things that I have found help people to understand um, the difference. One is, is the fact that the atomic bomb does instantaneously with a single explosion, with a single press of a button, what it would take phalanxes of uh, bombers and airplanes and fighters to accomplish. And because of that, you know, it's that much more threatening, a misunderstanding, a mistake, uh, an impulsive anger, can cause the dest instant destruction of entire cities and spread poison across entire countries. So that's one thing. 
that I think really distinguishes nuclear war. The other is the persistence of the disaster. Um, I think that the, the immediate destruction, while it may take longer and involve a lot more people, is maybe similar. But the nuclear weapons, because of radiation, poison people and poison, you know, the earth and poison the water, poison the rain. Um, and that poison spreads far beyond the initial target. And it can affect um, survivors and their children. And as I have explained, in my case, it can affect people who appear to have nothing to do with it. Um, and we're not there. And to, while, you know, certainly the trauma of participating in war affects soldiers, I don't think that that has the same effect on mass civilian populations far from the front, the battlefront. So those are two points that I have um, made in speaking to people, particularly in America, um, that seem to be helpful in bringing people to understand that, you know, there are two bad things, but they're not the same, war and nuclear war. Thank you I very much. That's very convincing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next questionnaire is uh, Minoru-san, please. You know, Mr. san thank you for your very moving, outstanding, and so detailed presentation. Actually, I have no word to express my feeling but just let me ask, where was your book published? And I would like to know, is there any plan to make it a, 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 a film in the future? I, I couldn't catch the second part. Ah, is there any a wish or plan to make your, your book story uh, uh, to a film? F film? Um, so the book was published um, by Book Baby, which is a company that's um, a self-publishing company. So, um, so basically, I published it, um, and uh, and I distribute it through them. Um, I had, I was told that as a self-published book, it would be considered successful if you were able to distribute three to five hundred copies. And so far, between the electronic, a lot of them are ebook copies, um, and the hard copies, I've been able to distribute 7,000. So I feel that I am lucky uh, as a self publisher to have uh, spread so far. Part of that is, is because um, I've, well, unfortunately, I published it right into a pandemic. <laughs> so I couldn't. Um, you know, make some of the efforts I wanted. Among other things, I had tickets to Japan and I had hoped to launch the book in Hiroshima um, and to give it to the people that uh, were so kind to me there. And obviously that couldn't happen. I'm hoping to visit there, though I have tickets to visit with my daughter in October. Um, but uh, as for the book, I, during the pandemic, I spoke to many, many different groups. Um, as I think um, is, is in there, I was lucky enough to win an award for the best um, narrative nonfiction book or creative nonfiction book published in that year. Um, so that helped. And um, I was reviewed in a number of different places. So uh, that's how the book was published and distributed. Um, I don't know about next steps, except I am trying to uh, work on a Japanese version because, uh, yeah, I would like for all my friends there to read it. Of course, many people there already know everything um, more than I do, but still, it's a different perspective, like I said, so I want to share it. Okay, thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Minoru-san. And, and maybe this will be the final questioner. Sachiko-san, please. Thank you for giving me a chance. 
So, let's see, Ethan, thank you very much for sharing your personal but very important global message with us. Actually, I was born and brought up in Hiroshima, and many of my families were the victims of this A bomb. But at the same time, our family members were also the soldiers who invaded other countries. So, that's why, as you mentioned, we just if we just focus on the past we may bring the hatred or another you know the negative things to the next generation that's why i'm so impressed because you try to empower people to focus on the future learn from the past and let's work together we build a great relationship together and also it is so inspiring for us because when i was young i heard many american people supported atomic bomb but thanks for you and your father and many people, American citizens who truly showed empathy and who truly showed how they can change the world view. Many people now agree we shouldn't have another war on nuclear issues. So my question is, when did you realize to focus on the future is a better way to unite people? So, um... As Morikawa-san mentioned at the beginning, um, I've been a pacifist since I was very young. Um, and that's one reason I joined the Quakers, who uh, probably um, are not very familiar. It's a small group, um, but it's, uh, it's similar to the Church of the Brethren, which uh, sends the uh, hosts for the um, World Friendship Center. Um, like Church of the Brethren, the Quakers are a, a peace church. And I began um, working uh, for peacemaking during the Vietnam War. And um, I saw many of my friends sent off to fight in a war they didn't believe in. And I didn't believe that, you know, there's a chapter in my book called War is Waste. Um, and I learned that from my father, even though my father was did not oppose all war, he opposed nuclear war. But he talked about um, Yeshima after the surrender, and he was ordered to throw trucks and equipment off cliffs into the ocean. Um, and he said, why are we doing that? It's perfectly good. Somebody can use it, because that's how my family is. Don't waste. Um, and they said, oh, if somebody else comes, they'll bring their own trucks. And he said, it's just waste. And from that, when he got to Nagasaki and Hiroshima, he, he felt all of this is waste. It's a huge waste. And that's what really stuck with me is, which, you know, whatever side you're on, this is my way of thinking of it. People see war and conflict like a, a picture, a snapshot. You take one snapshot. So you look at this and you say, see, these guys are terrible. We have to go fight them. Look at the terrible thing they're doing. But if you watch the whole movie and not just the snapshot, they came to that feeling, you know, that anger from something that happened before. And after you fight to them, there'll be another child coming back for revenge. It goes on forever when you fight the past. The only way is to start a new movie. I'm thinking like my father. So that's why I came to feel it's pointless to have an argument about who was right or wrong in some snapshot that someone took this picture years ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please feel free to write your question in the comment sheet. And later on, if there's your email address, we will share the answer from Leslie about your question. Thank you very much. And before closing special session, uh, I'd like to invite everybody for joining me in extending our special applause by clapping hands to Leslie for this amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and by the way, I love Toastmasters. I have a competent Toastmaster pin and was a member for many years. So yeah. I'm honored. <laughs> you, you used to be a Toastmaster many years ago. 